My name is Dr. Jake Felice. I am a naturopathic physician in Seattle, Washington, and my main area of focus is uh, natural approaches to pain management uh, as opposed to uh, some of the more conventional medications that a lot of patients use. Uh, a while back, I had the experience of having patients uh, come to me and repeatedly tell me about all of the medications that they are just taking themselves off of uh, by themselves, pain medications, opiate medications, uh, NSAIDs, um, benzodiazepines with medical cannabis. Uh, and so that got me very interested, especially in one day, I, I think I had four or five back-to-back -back patients with these amazing cannabis stories. So I, I did uh, what was inclined for myself as I was like, oh, I'm going to look into this. And what I found when I actually started looking at the research was uh, I was amazed. I was amazed at how vast the volume of the literature is, the scientific peer-reviewed literature uh, with cannabis. Cannabis is one of the most studies, studied plants uh, in the entire biosphere, on the entire planet of all the different kinds of plants. There may be only one or two plants that have more study, uh, more science behind them than cannabis. The endocannabinoid system is the system that the cells of our body use to talk to each other. It's like the internet of our body. Any single immune cell can send an email package through the endocannabinoid system to any cell in our nervous system, for example. Uh, what's also interesting that a lot of this communication occurs over a distance and it's also very quick. So uh, for, many, for, for many ways the short answer is the endocannabinoid system is the internet of our body and our cells are the individual computers talking to each other. When I first started doing my research on the endocannabinoid system the first thing that amazed me was the sheer vastness of it, meaning how big it is biologically. For example uh, in terms of nerve receptors. There are different types of uh, receptors in our nervous system. There are more cannabinoid receptors than there are any other type of receptor system in our nervous system. That's a huge point. For example, there are more cannabinoid receptors than there are opioid receptors, more than there are nicotinic receptors, acetylcholine receptors, and biology is stingy in a way. It doesn't, plants don't make things Animals and organisms don't make things just for fun, they make them for a purpose. So knowing that A, the endocannabinoid system is the most dense receptor system in our nervous system, and B, knowing that biology tends not to waste a lot of energy in performing its functions, that says to me, or that said to me, that this system is controlling so much information in our, in our bodies it's kind of like the deep structure of our uh, nervous system. Uh, for example, if you use the analogy of computers and computer programming, it wouldn't be something like an Excel or something like that, but it would be more like deep machine language. Uh, it's one of, the, uh, one of the most primitive information processing systems that we have. Uh, and because of that, uh, it's very important and it can operate on multiple systems at once. One of the other things that I first started realizing is, oh, how many different types of body systems the uh, endocannabinoid system covers. Uh, it actually covers every single system, every single physiologic system that we have looked at to date. Uh, um, and so, again, this is all very impressive, especially considering the fact that so very few physicians are even aware of the magnitude of this system. The endocannabinoid system was discovered in the early 1960s uh, by is an Israeli researcher by the name of uh, Raphael Meshulam. But my understanding is that they actually they found the CBD molecule before they found THC. So uh, we've known about uh, the basics of this system for not a very long period of time. Uh, and again, uh, only until very recently, um, None of the endocannabinoid system was discussed in medical schools at all, despite it being the most dense receptor system uh, in our entire nervous system. The endocannabinoid system consists of the uh, endocannabinoid molecules, uh, 2-AG and anandamide, uh, the um, enzyme systems that help break them down, uh, and the receptors. So that in a nutshell is what the ECS is, uh, but when we think about 
what it does in our body, that's where I think it really gets very exciting. Uh, and the, uh, there is a biological reason why this system is so prevalent in all of our different tissues. It has to deal with the evolutionary process uh, that single-celled organisms went through uh, all the way on their way to very advanced physiologies such as a human and all mam mammalian physiology has a very robust endocannabinoid system. Plants don't make these molecules just for fun. Uh, one of the main functions of the THC acid in the plant is to prevent uh, grazing from uh, insects. It's a, it's a kind of an anti, uh, it's an insecticide, so to speak. So the plant is literally making the THC acid specifically to interact on a, uh, on a physiology of uh, another animal. Um, the endocannabinoid system is 600 million years old, so that means the receptors, the locks of the key and lock, are 600 million years old. The key, which comes from the cannabis plant in terms of the THC, is only 200 million years old. So physiologically, we had this receptor system with the lock and key that now fits for about 400 million years of evolution with, uh, with, before cannabis was formed. Uh, the cannabis molecule coincidentally just so happens to fit this very intricate lock system. So the THC molecule is really a very uh, well-developed molecule to land on the CB1 receptors. Even though it's a plant molecule, it still has effect on our human physiology. What are the advantages physiologically of having a body? Because if we're talking about the endocannabinoid system going from uh, being developed as a single cell and throughout evolutionary history being involved in the development of very simple multi-celled organisms to more complex organisms with simple digestive tracts to more complicated organisms with digestive tracts and simple nervous system all the way on up through mammals, uh, there are some advantages of having a body. Uh, bodies tend to provide a buffer between the environment uh, and the internal physiology. So a bigger body can withstand a lot of the times a, a bigger shift in environment, whether that be in pH or temperature or in food availability. Uh, bodies also can, uh, uh, multicellular organisms also have food supplies that they can store so that they're much more robust over time. Uh, a biological organism needs to have a repair process uh, to fix things that go wrong in it so that it can continue to survive. Um, some of the things that uh, the endocannabinoid system did uh, very well is protecting our bodies or protecting the ancient bodies from lack of oxygen, which is a very strong kind of stress. How does that correlate in human terms? Well, now we know that, for example, the heart attack sizes in uh, laboratory animals are about 66% smaller than uh, the control group. And what's interesting about that size of 66% smaller is that that is through non-oxidative mechanisms. So we know that the cannabinoids are not bringing more oxygen to the tissues. Rather, they are helping the tissue survive in a less of an oxygenated environment. And, and there's uh, stroke protection, uh, other types of protection. Uh, physical trauma is another area where the endocannabinoid system so, uh, is very helpful. So if you think about what a body needs over time as it developed, the deep structure that was organizing all of uh, the physiologic functions, the endocannabinoid system, as organisms moved forward in complexity, that deep structure got laid into the cellular framework. So this is why nervous system, immune system, cardiovascular system, digestive system are all very, uh, 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 very influenced by the endocannabinoid system. Uh, the CB1 and CB2 receptors are the predominant cannabinoid receptors. Uh, they have slightly different locations. CB1 receptors tend to be predominantly in the nervous system and CB2 receptors tend to be in the periphery. Uh, there are exceptions to all of these. Uh, what's very interesting for me about the CB1 receptor is that it is behind the blood-brain barrier, a lot of it. So physiologically, 
uh, certain cannabis molecules or certain molecules that land on CB1 receptors uh, can easily make it through that blood-brain barrier uh, and reach the CB1 receptors. CB2 receptors tend to be outside of the nervous system. Uh, many plants actually will make molecules that land on the CB2 receptors outside of the nervous system. Echinacea is an example of that. Echinacea makes molecules that land on the CB2 receptors uh, which have some type of immune modulating function. Uh, if the echinacea molecules were able to cross the blood-brain barrier and land on the CB1 receptors, echinacea would be able to give people a head high, uh, potentially. But since that particular molecule does not cross into the blood-brain barrier uh, from the echinacea, uh, there's no head high associated with the echinacea, but there are immune uh, responses that are associated with it. Uh, versus the molecules in cannabis, marijuana, they're lipid soluble. Uh, they will cross over into, uh, into the nervous system much more easily landing on the CB1 receptors. CB1 receptors are the receptors that will cause a head high with marijuana. CB2 receptors do not cause a head high. Uh, there's huge advantages to that clinically because we can utilize the CB2 receptors uh, and patients uh, will not necessarily need to get a head high to have medical effects. When THC lands on the CB1 receptors, that creates a cascade of events uh, that causes the head high, uh, the psychedelic aspect of marijuana. Um, THC is very, very important clinically. Uh, I think that it has been getting short shrift lately with all of the publicity that CBD has been getting. But for the vast majority of clinical patients, the THC levels can be quite low. Uh, we know, for example, from some of the Sativex studies that the least amount of negative side effects from THC occur at the lowest effective dose. So you can give a patient a very low dose of THC. It doesn't necessarily give them a head high, but it can still, that low amount of THC landing on the CB1 receptors can also participate in anti-inflammatory and pain relieving aspects. Um, uh, the, the other molecules of marijuana uh, do not tend to create, uh, with the exception of Delta-8 THC, uh, don't tend to create a head high. Uh, so what is important with a CB1 receptor is for us to utilize the smallest amount that is necessary clinically to get the job done. This reduces um, uh, the euphoria, it reduces the risk of side effects, uh, and uh, in general, uh, I think is beneficial for patients. The other thing we know about dosing THC in the CB1 receptors is that low doses of THC will actually increase the number of CB1 receptors we have. So it's kind of the opposite of tolerance. You know, when you're using a, an opiate-based uh, molecule over time, the patient will become, they will adapt. Uh, in opiates over time, the, the, the cells will pull opioid receptors away from the cell membrane. With low doses of THC, the body actually creates more CB1 receptors. So with low doses, we can actually become more sensitive to the medicine and use less. Now, when CB1 receptors are stimulated at moderate or high levels, just as in the opiate system, we will see the receptors downregulate, and the, the body and the cells will, will take some of those receptors away from the cell membrane, making the endocannabinoid system less efficient. Uh, so the best way to use THC for the vast majority of cases is with low doses uh, and in combination with other molecules. What is the difference between Delta-9 THC and our body's own natural chemicals, anandamide and 2-AG. Um, they have a, a lot of their shape is different. For example, if you have a, think of the key in the lock. Uh, I have a Volkswagen key. You might have a Toyota key. The, the, the top part of the key might be very different, but the actual piece that goes into the lock to make it turn is similar. So our body through the 600 million years of evolution with the endocannabinoid system, uh, developed these molecules, 2-AG uh, and anandamide, uh, that naturally fit that 600 million year old lock. 200 million years ago, uh, 
the plant comes along and makes a different molecule, the THC, uh, part of which also coincidentally fits into that lock. Uh, if there is a head injury or stroke uh, or even stress, one of the first things that the body does, even if it's an exercise stress, is naturally raise the levels of endocannabinoids. It's a stress response. On the flip side of that are the receptors. Uh, and migraine headache, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, what's happening in a lot of those uh, disease states or syndromes is that the endocannabinoid system is not producing enough receptors. So somebody with a migraine headache might not have their CB1 receptors in the nervous system as many as, say, a normal control person would. Uh, because of that, the same amount of anandamide or the same amount of 2-AG is going to be doing less work. So there's two approaches we can use clinically to do that. As one is we can give uh, exogenous cannabinoids, cannabis cannabinoids, uh, which a lot of the time will very quickly take care of the migraine pain or the fibromyalgia pain or the cramping and bloating from irritable bowel syndrome. Um, uh, that, that's one way, and I think that that's the way the majority of clinicians uh, use cannabis. Another thing we can do if we have a motivated patient uh, is work, working on microdosing. Super low doses, as I had said before, will actually upregulate those receptors. So for migraine headache patients, very important for them to ha sometimes have whisper doses. Uh, and this can be varied. So for example, if you're having a full-blown attack, that's not maybe the time to have a whisper dose, but maybe a day or so later. Uh, so, so that we can use the exogenous cannabinoids, A, to uh, land on the receptors and make them work, and B, we can use ultra-low doses to help the body uh, increase the number of receptors uh, that are on the cell membranes. So we're just at a very exciting time uh, in terms of the research. What we found to date is that the whole plant is pretty consistently outperforming uh, the single molecule drugs that are being tested and developed. Uh, that may or may not change, uh, time will tell, uh, but if it does change, we'll have something that works even better than marijuana. So uh, right now, patients who are out of time, who don't have time to wait, I think that the whole plant is an excellent low toxic option for a number of uh, biological uh, disease states.